Well, thank you. It's, it's a great honor to be here and a great honor to represent class six. So I thought today I would tell you about what I do, uh, why it's interesting to me, but also why it's important. I'm a paleoecologist, which means that I study environmental change not as it happens over years and decades, but really as it plays out over centuries and millennia. And for me, the things that are interesting to me are the relationships between climate, vegetation, humans, and fire. And those components in and of themselves are complicated, but the interesting part are the arrows in between because the strength of those linkages changes depending on the temporal and spatial scale that you ask the question. My group in, in paleoecology in general, we work on lakes. Lakes are the place. Lakes are great collectors of environmental information. All of the matter that falls out of the sky and lands on the lake has a good potential of getting buried in the sediments. So we go to these lakes and we get sediment cores. The top layer of mud is the present day. And then you go back in time through the cores to the bottom layer, which is when the lake formed. And in most of the areas I've worked, it's about 15,000 or 20,000 years ago. So you have this wonderful record of change. We take these cores back to the lab. We slice them up. We take samples. We treat them with chemicals. And then we spend months and months really looking at what's in the cores under the microscope. We're experts in pollen analysis, and the reason for that is when you can identify the pollen grains in the lake sediments, you know what the plants were, and when you know what the plants were, you know the vegetation and you know the climate. We also look at charcoal particles in the sediments because they're a record of past fire, and we look at any other components in the sediment from the fossils to the geochemistry that helps amplify our ability to reconstruct the environment. So environmental history for me is you go to a place like Yellowstone National Park, the greater Yellowstone region, was completely covered by an ice cap 20,000 years ago. And the environmental history starts 17,000 years ago when the ice left. Now this is really ground zero. There, were no, there was no soil, there were no lakes, there were no plants, there were no animals. And so everything that you see today had to come in after that time. And understanding that sequence of events and the drivers of those events is uh, what's so interesting. A big event for me were the fires in Yellowstone in 1988, which burned about 40% of the park. At that time, we really hadn't looked at charcoal particles very carefully, but it seemed like a great opportunity to really look at them and try to understand how they could be a record of past fire events. So we spent the years after the 1988 fires going to small lakes in burned and unburned watersheds, and we monitored them for about 10 years, trying to understand how much charcoal they had received from 1988, how that charcoal had gotten into the lake, and then what happened once it was in the lake that brought charcoal to the deep water where we would get our sediment cores. And the techniques that our group developed uh, from that research really has now led to a global paleo fire database, a global charcoal database. These are charcoal records from around the world done by hundreds of analysts. Um, and it allows us to look at biomass burning as it plays out globally across continents and also uh, within regions. So here's a 15,000 year fire history from Yellowstone Park uh, based on a number of sites. And it goes back uh, to the end of the last glaciation. And so you can see at the end of the last glaciation, there were very few fires. It was cold. There wasn't a lot of fuel to burn. But then as the climate warmed, the fire, uh, fire activity increased really rapidly. So we had really high fire activity. Then it dropped a bit, and it was high around six to 7,000 years ago. And fire activity has been declining for the last 6,000 years in Yellowstone Park until the 1988 event. And you can take that 1988 event and compare it to the kind of fire activity or charcoal abundance over different time spans to see how unprecedented that event was. If you look at the last 200 years, which is roughly the time that Yellowstone National Park has been around, 1988 fires were indeed very unusual. Nothing was quite like it in terms of the size or, or severity of the fire. If you go back 7,000 years, 
And this is the time when the modern vegetation developed in the park. It's still an unusual event. There's a few large events, but not many. You have to go back 15,000 years in, to see fires that are of that size and severity uh, based, on, based on the information that we have. So paleoecology lets you look under the hood a bit and see how, um, how processes play out over time. What's the natural variability on a longer time scale than you might be able to do in most ecological studies? So I want to give you uh, three examples of paleo-informed conservation. Uh, and I want to call out my heroes and mentors in this business, uh, both, men both uh, members of the National Academy. Uh, one is Herb Wright, a professor at the University of Minnesota, uh, and the other is Estella Leopold at the University of Washington. Both of these people taught me that paleoecology is a powerful tool and that it can and should be used for the betterment of the planet. And I want to give you three examples here, and I pick these examples because they lie along a gradient of present-day land use. The first is from Yellowstone, which I think you could say today is in a nearly pristine condition. These are the high elevation pine forests. Then I want to give you an example from New Zealand, where we've worked. This is an area that has both altered and natural ecosystems. And the last example is from Sicily, um, agricultural land that's highly altered. So let me start with Sicily. There's a lot of conservation effort in Sicily to bring back this tree, Quercus ilex, the evergreen oak. Um, it grows throughout the Mediterranean, but it's very, very rare in Sicily now, so there's a great effort to kind of restore it and um, protect it. And we can understand the history of Quercus ilex by the sediment cores from this particular lake. Um, this was studied by my Swiss colleagues. And here's the pollen record of Quercus ilex shown in the green, along with some of the other shrubs and trees. It goes back 10,000 years ago, and you can see that Quercus ilex was not very abundant till about 7,000 years ago, and then it was really the dominant tree on the landscape. And it was the dominant tree till about 2,000 years ago when its populations just crashed. Well, 2,000 years ago is the beginning of the Roman period in Sicily, and so it's not hard to figure out what happened to this tree. Its loss was due to agriculture, grazing, and fires. You can ask, well, what would it take to bring this tree back to Sicily? What if we took out fires and grazing, for example? Could we bring Quercus ilex back to the landscape? Well, landscape models give us some idea of what's possible. If we took disturbance out or if we had low disturbance, we could bring this tree back probably within the next 60 years or so if we could keep those uh, levels of disturbance down. The problem is with the future climate, the climate's going to be too warm and too dry to bring this tree. And it doesn't matter how much you reduce fire or grazing, it's quite unlikely that Quercus ilex will be able to come back. So what are the paleo messages? Well, first, the history of this tree, its demise is driven by centuries of land use, not by climate. And the potential for restoration is probably pretty good under the present conditions, but it's unlikely to survive in the future with warming. So I think it's fair to say, in terms of a restoration or conservation project, it might not be worth putting a lot of effort into this species. It's not going to have a good future on Sicily. New Zealand's a place where we've worked quite a bit, and New Zealand's quite interesting. 3,000 years ago, we know from pollen records that both islands were completely forested, except for the highest elevations, which were covered by glaciers. And then when the Europeans arrived, what they found were islands that were half covered by grass and shrubland. In other words, half of the forest was gone. Well, what happened? Well, we think that the deforestation event, deforestation event, um, happened with the arrival of the Polynesians, the Maori, who came in 1280 AD in small populations, and they were hunter-gatherers. We've done a lot of work looking at small lakes in the South Island of New Zealand, and you can see their impact really clearly. So this is a record of the last thousand years from all of these lakes, and you can see that prior to the arrival of the Maori, there's almost no charcoal in the record at all. Then the Maori come, 
And within the first few centuries, there's one, two, or three fires at all of the lakes. And it's in this interval that we see a loss of the tree pollen as well. Then there's a period at most sites of fairly quiescent conditions until the Europeans arrive around 1840. Well, we think when we look at individual sites that this deforestation event happened in 100 years or less. Uh, and so that leads us to believe that the, the burning was both deliberate and intentional. Um, and it was able to convert these closed forests into this open grassland. Now, why were they so successful at burning? Probably the main reason is that the native forests in this region are very vulnerable to fire. They've never evolved with fire. There were probably very few, if any, fires over most of New Zealand prior to the arrival of people. And what comes in after fire is this very shaggy barked uh, small tree and shrub. That's a very flammable, those are very flammable plants, and so they burn very easily. And so you set up this positive feedback where you have a fire, these shaggy barked shrubs come in, they cause another fire, and gradually you eat away at the native forest until there's nothing left. So what are the uh, messages from uh, the beach podocarp forest of New Zealand? First of all, the fires there are mostly human generated. The native forest is highly vulnerable to these fires because they have no adaptations to uh, resist or survive fires. And fire is very, um, is, it, it creates these positive feedbacks where fire begets more fire. And so it leads to very rapid forest loss. The management message here is that if you want to protect those last remaining bits of native forest, you really have to go into full fire suppression mode. You have to do everything you can to take fire out of this system. So looking over the last 8,000 years, you can see the impact that people have had in how we've shifted the landscape condition through time. Uh, so for example, in Sicily, Land use has altered the natural vegetation in sort of a step-like sequence, giving us this very degraded uh, landscapes that we see today. In New Zealand, the vegetation was really pristine until the arrival of first the Maori uh, 800 years ago, and then the Europeans. And what about a place like Yellowstone, which has been more or less in a fairly pristine condition for most of its history? People have been there, but they haven't altered the landscape in ways that wouldn't have probably happened naturally. And here I want to focus on the white pines. This is uh, limber pine and white bark pine. Um, and I want to focus on the high elevation forests in particular. These are getting clobbered today by things like mountain pine beetle, by white pine blister rust. There's been a lot of fires. Uh, but these trees are very valued species. They're used by a lot of mammals for f as a food source. And so there's been this call to uh, take on really active restoration and plant these white bark pines so that they'll be able to survive. And the biggest threat is climate change. Uh, if you look at the distribution of white bark pine today, uh, you can see by the red map for 2010, it's got a fairly good distribution, but if you as the climate continues to warm, the probability of its occurrence is going to get less and less. And, and literally, white bark pine forests are going to be pushed off the tops of the mountains as it gets warmer and um, may not be able to survive in the Yellowstone region. Well, when I see this kind of map that's based on present day distributions as a paleoecologist, it kind of perks my interest because I wonder, well, what does the paleoecology record show about that? We looked at all the white pine pollen records from the region. And it was interesting to us, they go back 15,000 years, that there's this period when white pines were really quite abundant in the Yellowstone region, between about 13,000 and 7,000 years ago. And then since then, the abundance of white pine has declined. The reason for this abundance it can be told by looking at other environmental proxy. So here's the period of high abundance. This was a time of high summer temperatures. Um, it was actually warmer then than it, than it has been today. And so this idea that it will be pushed off the mountains because of warmer, at least summer temperatures, I think you could call into question. It also was a time when one of its major competitors, Engelmann spruce, 
was on the decline. The climate was no longer suitable for it, and it was becoming less and less abundant. So I think that led to the abundance of white pine. Surprisingly, it was this time of high fire activity. And so it's clear that the species can survive more fires than we're seeing now. But its decline, I think, is also related to another competitor in the Yellowstone ecosystem, and that's the arrival of lodgepole pine. So just to summarize, white bar pine had a wider niche in the past than we see today, and we have to take that into account, I think, as we're doing planning for the future. It seems to have survived more fires, at least more lower severity fires, and warmer summers in the past. Now, it may be that there's other aspects of the components of the climate going forward that are not as suitable for it. Competition with other species is as important as climate in determining its distribution. So I think the management message, for me at least, is to have some faith in the capacity of this tree to survive climate change for a while longer, uh, let fires burn, and monitor it closely to make sure uh, it's doing OK before you actually intervene. So paleoecology clarifies conservation goals. When you're in that pristine part of the graph, you really have the capacity to monitor for the historical range of variability. However, when you're in the Sicily side of the graph, you don't have that ability any longer, and you really have to think about what your cultural and heritage values are in deciding what your objectives are. It's this in-between area, places like New Zealand, where you have natural and altered that really require the most attention and I think are going to be the most challenging uh, in terms of setting conservation goals. Well, just in closing, I, I think it's fair to say how relevant is looking at the past for the future as we move into more and more uncharted territory as a result of um, climate change and other anthropogenic effects? Is the past really going to tell us anything about the future? And I just wanted to share some of the connections that I've made talking to Montanans about climate change. Uh, and this comes about as the release of the first ever Montana climate assessment and going around uh, the state uh, asking people what are their concerns. First of all, I think it's really clear that going into the future, we're going to have to live with ecological change. From a paleo point of view, every time there's climate changes, species have had to adapt. They've had to reorg we've, had, we've seen reorganizations of communities. Species either have to evolve, move, or go extinct. And that's what we're seeing now with all of these um, interactions and moving, movements of animals and plants. So we need, as a conservation point of view, we need to allow that capacity for change. We also need to learn with live, to live with fires. Uh, every time in the past it's been warmer, we've seen more fires. That's just a basic relationship. And we're going to see more and more fires as we go in the future. And these fires are actually going to serve as the catalyst of ecological change. The problem with fires now, of course, is that there's social dimensions to them as well as ecological. So it becomes one of those wicked problems that really requires a lot of uh, thought to, to figure out how we're going to deal with it. We need to live with uncertainty. Periods of rapid climate change always involve surprises, more floods, more droughts, heat waves, fires, and so on. And conservation strategies need to be highly adaptive to account for this. We need strategies that provide resilience for ecosystems and also some redundancy. And finally, let me just do a call out to the value of these nearly pristine ecosystems. And these are lands that are both public and private. These are the really places that have some functionality and some, some intactness to them. They're the reservoirs of diversity, and they're the places where we can really understand historical range of variability and look at natural processes. As such, they become the baselines for conservation as we try to figure out what to do in these more altered places that are outside of the boundaries. These ecosystems are, are important beyond their footprint because they're iconic and they inspire people, but they also serve as an opportunity for education where we can get people to think about the consequences of climate change and other uh, perturbations that are going on around us. So thank you. <laughs>